We've been in business for decades. We've never had a business plan. So whatever I learn today, I'll try to apply that and carry it forward. That's all a learning process. It's funny because I think the way we run the business is the way people skateboard. And that is you just learn and make it up as you go and you add to your vocabulary and you add to your skills. So yeah, it's all good. We're all learning as we go. That's Peter Dukeman of Qualicum Beach. We'll chat about Skull Skates, Canada's oldest skateboard company, PD's Hot Shop with locations in British Columbia and Japan, and his snowboard exhibition, his bicycle and skateboard collection, when Today in BC continues. Hey, it's the Moj, Bob Marjanovic. Join me on the Moj on Sports podcast on Black Press Media at todayinbc.com. Listen into conversations with well-known athletes and celebrities as we look behind the scenes at these successful people. Listen in to the Moj on Sports podcast on todayinbc.com. You'll also find the Moj on Sports podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, YouTube, and Google Podcasts, as well as mojonsports.com. Thanks for being with us today, Peter. Hey, nice to be with you as well. Thanks for coming. You grew up in Nanaimo skateboarding with your brother and turned your hobby into a business when you made your way to Vancouver to open PD's Hot Shop. I understand your mother opened a skateboard shop in Nanaimo, so she must have been a pretty cool mom. She was a pretty cool mom. This was after I had left in the 80s when the shop opened, I think 83, 84, somewhere in that neighborhood anyway. It was pretty great because she was already an older lady at that point, but she wasn't in the habit of taking any crap from anyone, so it was a perfect balance to run a skateboard shop. For those of us who had a board at some point in our lives, it was a pretty simple, pretty fun thing to do. You could keep yourself entertained for a long time and get where you needed to go pretty inexpensively. And it wasn't exclusive. Everybody had a board. Yeah, skateboarding's a funny thing. It may not always be a friendly welcome, but everybody's welcome in skateboarding. This sort of inclusive buzzword thing, that's not new in skateboarding. <laughs> that's since the get-go. I only recall helmets being around in my day. I don't remember any of the other safety gear. Did you have many injuries growing up as a skateboarder? As a skateboarder, you're always going to get injured. But the good news is you really learn to heal. And you learn how to fall down better. You never stop falling down, but you learn how to fall down better. The helmet thing, it's not exclusive to skateboarding. I think in the early days, a lot of us maybe didn't think so much about head injuries. But you can look in a lot of sort of activities where people are putting themselves in potential peril. We didn't really think about helmets till a little bit later on. You and your late brother, Rick Dukeman, who had a pretty solid career in film and comedy. I remember Rick most for working with Alan Thick. You founded your own board company, Skull Skate. So tell us how that all came about. How we started selling skateboards at T-shirt company, the old iron-on T-shirts. I don't know if any of your listeners will recall Dog's Ear T-shirt. You'd go in and there'd be all these designs and you'd pick your color and your style of shirt and your print and they'd put it on for you with an iron-on press. Rick was in that business and so he had to go to California a couple times a year. I started giving him lists for bring me back some skate stuff. My friends started giving lists for bring us back some skateboard stuff. And a sort of a light one on over our heads like, oh... People in Canada want this stuff and you can't get it. So that was the start of the skateboard shop followed by our skateboard company. So you must have been fairly young when you opened uh, PD's Hot Shop. In yeah, I was just a puppy. And the reason that I was able to pull it off is that Rick was 10 years my elder. And I don't know what the regulations are, but I imagine they wouldn't allow a, a minor to sign a lease and whatnot in those days, or if they do now, to, for that matter. <laughs> when your brother Rick traveled to Los Angeles and started making his home there and getting regular work... I understand you opened a shop there as well? We did have a shop on Melrose. Melrose was a pretty hot spot in the 80s as far as it was like a cool place to have a store. We also had a warehouse out in Van Nuys in the valley, San Fernando Valley, where we supplied shops, I guess, all over the world from that location. And as the brand Skull Skates became better known, you were asked to build custom boards for some of the competitors of the day. One of those being Steve Olson. I guess his son Alex is a well-known boarder now. Yeah, Alex is great, and we love Steve, too. We had sponsored people prior to him, but he was the first guy that was a really known entity in skateboarding and was incredibly skilled, and still to this day is an amazing skater. So that was a big opportunity for us, and it definitely opened some doors for us, not only in California, but worldwide, I would say. It's 
always hit and miss when you're building a brand. It doesn't matter what the product is or the service is, but any brand. And to try and get that magic moment when folks just remember the product and uh, can pinpoint it. Tell us about the story of your brother Rick getting visibility in a movie he was in with some guy named Tom Hanks. There were a few of those, actually. The one you're referring to is The Burbs. But Rick was a clever fellow, I will say, because that wasn't the first time he had pulled this off. Generally, I think the process for getting your brand in a movie is that you pay for the rights to and then give a bunch of product to the production people, and somehow or another that stuff makes its way into the film. Rick had a kind of a different style, which was one of the other actors in the film was playing a young fellow that was wearing a shirt of some sort, and Rick went up and gave him, I think, some bit of pocket money and one of our <laughs> T-shirts and said, hey, buddy, why don't you wear this? I remember when we saw that in the theater. Of course, you still went to see movies in the theater in those days. I think our logo looked like it was about 10 feet tall on the screen when it came out. So <laughs> it was a good little bit of marketing, and I give Rick full credit for that one, of course. So you mentioned that wasn't the first time he did that, and you have a couple of other good stories? Uh, yeah, our logo first appeared in a skateboard magazine in 1979, and that was at a big contest that was in Marina Del Rey at the skate park there, and it was the same kind of action. There was a sponsor there from Northern California. There had always been a NorCal-SoCal rivalry, and this particular brand's had their banner up, and Rick approached one of the riders in the contest and said, hey, man, do you want to make 100 bucks? Go ahead and tear down that banner and put our banner up. You're supposed to pay for space. It's supposed to be authorized. But skateboarding's a little bit that way. There's another movie that's an underground cult classic in skateboarding. Really lousy movie called Thrashin' that came out in the 80s. Exact same technique there to get our logo out in front of people. So through the side door, you could say. And for today's generation, it probably doesn't hurt when some kid named Justin Bieber shows up in a, a video with a jacket with the Skull Skates logo on it. Yeah, actually, I think that image showed up as a promotion for a tour that he did last year. It was funny. We took a lot of heat on the internet, people saying that we were sellouts and how could we, and, you know, assuming that we had somehow given this fellow our product when, when we didn't at all. I, we, to this day, have no idea where he got this vintage 1980s jacket that somehow he had found and worn. When that stuff goes off and it's not the first time, we just don't participate. So online, there was all kinds of naysayers. We didn't comment at all. But the funny thing is one person would say something negative and sort of 10 or 20 people would jump in and defend us. <laughs> so we just let it ride. I think that it would be difficult to have to apologize every time somebody famous appears wearing our stuff. So we just let it ride. When Today in BC continues, Peter Dukeman talks about the PD's hot shop in Japan and the snowboard industry. Why spend hours searching dealerships, comparing makes and models? Find the best of BC's inventory in one place, todaysdrive.com. You'll have access to inventory across BC, where you can easily find a vehicle that fits your needs and gets you where you need to go in comfort. Get in the driver's seat. Don't miss out on the many options we have available for you. Powered by Black Press Media, todaysdrive.com connects you with exclusive new and used car deals. Today in BC is a Black Press Media podcast. I'm Peter McCulley. Peter, you've made and supplied boards for some celebrities. Let's say some interesting bands. Some of the bands that we've made skateboards for over the years have gone on to gain some recognition. First one that comes to mind is Red Hot Chili Peppers, a band called Social Distortion. And just over the years, we continue to make some pretty interesting products for primarily a lot of sort of interesting bands, some of them famous, some of them not so famous. It's just one of those things that we got onto. We made boards for bands out of Japan, like the Coquette Hipsters that are a huge band over there. And it's been pretty fun. And we've made pro models for a bunch of skateboarders. You mentioned Steve Olson. Um, his sponsorship ride was followed by a fellow named David Hackett, another guy named Dwayne Peters. All of these guys pretty famous in the skateboard world. Outside of skateboarding, maybe not so much. Am I correct in stating that Skull Skates introduced the hammerhead shape board to the industry? Yeah, how could I miss Christian Hosoi? Thanks for that. So that was not our design. That was Christian Hosoi, one of the f most famous skateboarders. And essentially, we just got together and we had this capacity to produce skateboards. And so someone like Christian, who had this great idea for a board, which was shaped just as the name refers to, it was shaped like a hammerhead. 
and we produce those. And I would say that in the 80s, since then, those are the biggest quantities, the biggest numbers that we've ever produced. Boards in the sort of thousands and even tens of thousands, whereas these days we're doing sort of 50 to 100 of a board at a time, which is by choice, actually. We intentionally prefer to be small these days. And tell us, when you're making a smaller run board, where they're made and how they're made. Our stuff's made in Canada. It's worth saying because, unfortunately, the majority of the industry, like I'm talking sort of 90%, now makes their skateboards in places like China and Mexico, which we don't necessarily care where they're made. It's just that when you take something offshore and produce it in a large quantity, as most of the other brands do, very difficult to maintain any kind of quality control at a level that we like to keep it at anyway. And I understand most of the wood comes from Quebec? That's the thing. Even the product that's being made in other countries, all the wood is coming from the northeast of continent of North America. So that means U.S. and Canada. Our theory is you want to cut the wood, make it into veneers, press it all in the same climate and seal it up so that you get this fresh liveliness of the wood sealed into the board. Makes a big difference. Makes them a lot stronger. Increases the torsional strength, increases the impact resistance. You want a snappy, lively, responsive board, and that's what our boards are. When I came into the skateboard shop today, PD's Hot Shop, I was flabbergasted, I guess, by the quality of the artwork on the boards. When I was a skateboarder, they were pretty much a stamped logo on the bottom or the underside of the board. But here, I'm looking at the boards years later, and the artwork is phenomenal. Well, and that is how it all started, is that most skateboards look like I don't know, a water ski or just a utility. It was just the name Johnson Skateboards or something like that in a sort of nondescript text and very kind of boring, for lack of a better word. Skateboarders tend to be pretty creative people. I don't know that we were the first, but we had to be one of the earlier people that just developed a logo. And some people may recognize it from being around for a while. It's a kind of a crudely drawn skull with the word skates written underneath. Together, that represents Skull Skates. And we just kept going with it, as other brands have. And over the years, the graphics have continued to become more elaborate and very interesting, some of them. Not only in execution, but theme as well. If folks are wondering how big and diverse the skateboarding industry is, they might be interested in knowing the Vancouver Museum has held exhibitions of skateboards. Were you involved in those? Yeah, actually, there was just the one, and it was called Skateboarding Vancouver, and it was based on an invite from the museum. It was a huge success. What we learned real quick is that a lot of people outside of skateboarding are very interested in the culture. So that particular exhibit got extended to 12 months, got extended to 18 months. They eventually wanted to take it on the road to seven other cities, which we didn't do in the end because we were a little bit worried about the care that would be extended to the archival material. But it was a huge success. So you started out building skateboards, but as the company grew, you also helped pioneer the snowboard industry. The skateboard and the snowboard thing were very similar in that we were selling other people's products, and our motivation to get started doing our own thing was not this idea of, wow, we could make and sell a bunch of stuff and make money. It was more like, this skateboard would be really cool if it was about a half inch wider, and the wheelbase was a bit shorter, and then snowboarding was the same kind of thing. We got in at the really developmental stages. I started in 1979, and by 1983, we were making our own board because we just saw that there was a need for them to evolve and that we wanted to be part of that from a participatory standpoint, like being avid into this stuff. You're just thinking, how can we skate better? How can we snowboard better? We can try harder, and we can also make the equipment better. So how did the store in Japan come about? The store in Japan opened in 1994, and that came about as a result of my good friend Satoshi, whom I'd met. He had been on a four-year student visa in Vancouver. We had hooked up, likely through the shop initially, but then eventually we became good friends, snowboarding, going up the local mountains on the North Shore. And at the end of his four-year stay, he approached me and said, hey, I have no idea about running a store. I'm completely clueless, and I'd like to open a store like this in Japan. And I said, perfect. That works for me. Let's do it. (laughs) And it's been going since. So are the Japanese customers looking for the same things that North American customers do in a board? Yeah, primarily. Although I will say that Skull Skates Japan is very similar to Skull Skates North America. Slightly different. They've put their own kind of spin on it. 
as mentioned, we've always been connected with the music scene, which is how we got into putting out boards for different bands. But that's something that our Japan shop has really picked up and run with. They do, I think, from two to four major national tours a year with several bands. It could be six to eight bands and half a dozen different dates. We're still connected with all that stuff, but them even more so. We're chatting today in the newest location, which is in Qualicum Beach on Vancouver Island, the oldest postal code in Canada. <laughs> Some might consider that an odd choice for a skateboard shop. Here's a funny thing is that we had that same kind of preconceived notion about Qualicum Beach. It's a bunch of sort of stodgy old people. What we found out real quick is that I'm an old people myself. I'm 60 years old, but also... People that are in their 70s, 80s, 90s have lived some really interesting lives and lived in very interesting times. It turns out, additionally, old people have kids, they have grandkids. We've got a high school just down the road here full of kids. There's a bunch of new families that have been moving into the area recently. I guess on paper it doesn't look like a good fit, but that's skateboarding in a nutshell. It goes where it wants to in a way. And of course you're doing lots of business online and You don't have to be in any one particular place to do business online. That's true. We've done mail orders since 1976. We've done online since 1995. And our attitude was with Qualicum Beach, hey, if nobody comes and nobody buys the stuff, we'll still have a cool shop and live right above it in a great town. And so who cares? Off to the side of where we're chatting, you've just opened a cultural exhibition, I guess we could call it, of snowboards with with over 100 boards there. It's been fun. It's a little bit of work putting it together, but worth it in the end. The concept that we've come up with based on that Vancouver Museum exhibit years ago is that this space is a popular culture museum. So we're featuring a lot of things that are spin-offs of skateboard culture, but other things too. And the very first sort of proper exhibit that we've staged is based on vintage snowboards. It's pretty interesting. Anytime you go back a few decades and you start lining things up in a chronological order... Even for someone who's never had any experience snowboarding, it really does set the imagination wandering as to just what was going on and how these things develop. And you can really see it through the equipment. Will there be other exhibits? Yeah, this exhibit is up now and it's slated to stay up until April 15th of 2023. And we've got a pretty extensive collection of vintage skateboards vintage bicycles, things like Japanese robot toys and Star Wars toys and even just household goods, just weird things that they don't make anymore. A telephone that looks like a bikini or just ridiculous funny things like that. And so that's the concept is that these shows will feature those kind of interesting cultural artifacts or oddities. You know. Here's a question for you. What do you wish you had known when you started the business that you now know? Nothing. Everything's a day-to-day, hand-to-mouth. This is a funny thing because I like to say this, and it's so true. We've been in business for decades. We've never had a business plan. So whatever I learned today, I'll try to apply that and carry it forward. Now it's all a learning process. It's funny because I think the way we run the business is the way people skateboard, and that is you just learn and make it up as you go, and you add to your vocabulary, and you add to your skills. So yeah, it's all good. We're all learning as we go. Do you still take a regular spin on the board? As long as I'm breathing, I'm going to ride a skateboard. It's one of those things that once it enters your system, it's a hard thing to shake. I like to skate as much as I can. I don't skate in the rain. And I don't do the kind of things that I used to do, but it doesn't matter, man. The pleasure you can get from just rolling around this little town is pretty substantial, I would say. (laughs) It's a good feeling. I'd like to thank Peter Dukeman of Skull Skates for being with us on this edition of Today in BC. If you have suggestions or comments, send a voice message to podcast at blackpress.ca. You may be part of our podcast mailbag segment. You'll find Today in BC podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, and Google Podcasts.